Hi, I'm Rainer, and I'm going to talk about render graphs and how you can pragmatically extend them to be more powerful using traditional concepts from compiler theory. Graphical program representations have always been commonplace in computer graphics. Render graphs specifically have become a standard representation for the analysis and optimization of rendering work about to be offloaded to the GPU. An example for a render graph is shown at the bottom of the slide. In these graphs, nodes describe render passes and edges describe data dependencies between their inputs and outputs. Pessimistically, we could say that render graphs have become an industry standard because low-level modern APIs have shifted the optimization burden to the application. One of the reasons for Vulkan's verbosity is that we have to announce future usages of resources to the API. So render graphs do not only abstract away all the low-level details, but allow inspection of future usages. The core architecture of a render graph based renderer usually looks as follows. We first build an acyclic dependency graph through tracing. Since future usages are known, we can then run analysis and optimization passes to, for example, place barriers and assign resources before executing the acyclic graph in topological order. However, the render graph construction happens frequently, such as every frame. Therefore, preventing any powerful analysis and optimization that may take several milliseconds to execute. To be more precise, such powerful optimizations, for example, include the removal of unused inputs and outputs of shaders in our render passes. This would require an analysis on the instruction level between multiple shaders and API calls, followed by a shader recompilation. A second shortcoming that forces us to rebuild the render graph frequently is missing support for cyclic dependencies, which would allow us to express loops and conditional execution of render passes. This is a surprising limitation since cyclic dependencies are quite common in computer graphics. They are part of the render loop, temporary projection, and recursive algorithms such as ray tracing and iterative denoises. As a result, Developers hide resources and dependencies for these passes outside of the render graph or support them through ad hoc solutions. And this will be the focus of our talk. We present a pragmatic extension of render graphs to a compiler intermediate representation that allows cyclic dependencies and instruction level planning. In this system, we execute the same three steps. We again go through construction, analysis and optimization, and execution. However, the render loop and any other control flow is moved into the graph. Analysis and optimizations, therefore, are only executed once ahead of time. In the example on the left, we are using an embedded DSL that uses a helper function do while to capture the render loop. Since our graph contains control flow, we batch render passes that are guaranteed to execute together into blocks. In contrast to acyclic render graphs, the output node of a data dependency is not always unique. There may be multiple candidates or versions of a logical variable. In this example, the previous frame for TAA is either a cleared image in the first frame or the output of the previous iteration of the render loop. For these cases, we follow traditional compiler theory and insert a phi node in these places. This phi node selects the correct output based on the control flow edge that we use to enter the block. Notably, this phi partitions our cyclic render graph into acyclic patches. And the phi node tells us how to adapt resources when we transition between acyclic blocks. So in most usage scenarios, it tells us which bindings need an update. To determine resource reuse, we can now compute lifetimes and conflict graphs for inputs and outputs. A colorization of this conflict graph gives us a resource allocation with reuse, where each color represents a resource. In traditional render graphs, we would do this intuitively using a free list and a topological traversal. In our generalized setting, we can rely on a well-known linear time algorithm which visits each block in a specific order. 
coloring the acyclic contents of each block with the same topological traversal. We just have to be careful to insert additional edges for the false dependencies introduced by the reuse of a color. Using this resource assignment, we compute a resource transfer graph for each edge leading into the phi. The input color is the source of an arrow, the output color is the target of an arrow. To avoid copies between resources, we want to execute these transfer graphs as a permutation of resources whenever possible. We therefore complete transfers to cycles. These are all the mandatory planning steps, so let us walk through an example execution. We first dispatch commands in the start block. We then jump into the render loop. And on this edge, the phi only has self loops, so there's nothing to do. So we can execute the commands in the render loop. And for the second frame, in the second iteration of the render loop, we now have to transfer resources by swapping the red and the yellow resource before, again, dispatching the loop body. And this step will repeat until the application closes. So notably, this approach rediscovers ping pong buffering, the code that you would write manually for temporary reuse anyways. And that's already the main result that I wanted to show today. While this high-level render graph is executable, optimizations are still quite challenging. That is because many optimization decisions depend on details not present in the graph. Command buffer submissions, for example, are implicit in our graph, which prevents the optimization of any API commands that bind to the command buffer. So we iteratively replace the high-level input until only API-level nodes remain. In this example, we first unfold an opaque SVG FD noiser pass to an iterative shader dispatch. Before replacing our mid-level compute shader node with all the necessary Vulkan API commands. Our representation is general enough to represent spill V in almost a one-to-one -one mapping. Therefore, we may even continue this replacement replacing shader nodes with their individual spill-v shader instructions. This reveals the data dependencies between shaders down to the instruction level, which, in turn, allows us to delete unused inputs and outputs from the graph by looking for realizable paths starting at some desirable side effect. This desirable side effect is the swap chain present call in most rendering engines. A cool feature of this method is that it allows us to selectively write low-level Vulkan by mixing high-level instructions with low-level instructions. We usually insert API functions for command buffer recording automatically, but the user may include them manually, for example, if he wants different usage flags. And if you happen to write this code manually, we have enough information in the graph to emit validation errors ahead of time even before we allocate any GPU state or start execution. In this example, we forgot to enter command buffer recording before submission. So to summarize, we have shown you how to support cyclic dependencies in your render graphs. This lifts the requirement to rebuild the render graph each time the combination of render passes changes, which allows you to perform more involved optimizations, such as rewriting shaders. A longer technical description of our method will be part of an upcoming research paper. Thanks for listening.